My topic is, it is false that scriptural fellowship can exist without adherence to the truth. Now let's take the first part of that off. Uh, it is false that. And let's just look at the statement that we're trying to determine whether it's true or false. Scriptural fellowship can exist without adherence to God's word. I think I would put strict in there, strict adherence to God's word. Because there are some people that would believe that, uh, yeah, you have to have uh, adherence to God's word. But like Danny was talking about earlier, some people aren't too strict on how they handle the word of God. And so strict adherence to the truth. We can't pick and choose. Now that's what we're here to talk about. Is that statement true or false? Well, I, my, my title implies that it's false. And I agree with that 100%. There's no question that this is a false statement. Anytime I want to talk about or study fellowship, the first passage that comes to my mind is 1 John chapter 1. And so if you would, turn there with me, and let's read that whole chapter. 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. So basically our lesson is what's the basis of fellowship? Really, what is the basis of fellowship? And John says, uh, or writes in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. There's no doubt by reading this that Jesus was a real person. He wasn't some vision. He wasn't some illusion. He wasn't just a man. He existed with the Father from the beginning. So he's, he's, he's God in the flesh. And those are some things, some observations we look at just at the very first of our lesson. And he says, that which we have seen, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So fellowship is vertical. In other words, it's fellowship between man and God. It goes from earth to heaven, heaven to earth. And it's also horizontal between believers. In other words, if, if two people believe in God and they have fellowship with God, then they have fellowship with one another. So it's, it's horizontal and vertical. The vertical fellowship cannot exist unless the horizontal fellowship with God exists first. All right. So, so our fellowship was with the Father and Son, but, but John is preaching. He's declaring to them the things that they've seen in order for them to have fellowship. He's trying to bring them into this fellowship. And he does it by teaching them. And by the way, before we go any further, how would you know that there was such a thing as fellowship if you didn't have the truth of the Bible? See, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know anything about fellowship except God told us in the Bible. So, so right there, there's one point as far as adherence to the truth goes in favor of fellowship. All right, so this then, verse 5, uh, all right, verse 4, he said, These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so when we think about our text, the first thing that we receive regarding fellowship is the message. This is the message, John says. Fellowship is based on a message. And what is that message? This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's the message that we must understand. And there's some implications that go into that statement that we're going to talk about in the course of this lesson. The message is, is synonymous with the gospel. It's synonymous with the truth. It's synonymous with the living word of God. And in fact, anything... That, that refers to the word, we could use the Bible in general as, as the message. Because when we think about the message, the message starts in Genesis and goes all the way through Revelation. Now, when we think about this idea of the truth and walking in the light, when we think about walking in the light, what does that mean? Verse 7, we have fellowship. If, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So our fellowship, first off, is based on a message. And then it's based on walking in the light. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of, of uh, question over that. And I don't think it's that difficult to understand because if we go to 3 John in verse 4, when John's writing to Gaius, he says that he talks about his children walking in the truth. So we compare walking in the light in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, with 3 John verse 4, and we see that walking in the light is the same thing as walking in the truth. Now if fellowship is based on a message, and it's based on walking in the light, and the message is the truth, and then we walk in the truth, then we have to ask the question, does adherence to the truth have anything to do with the basis of fellowship? And the obvious answer is yes. Yes, it does. Now let's think for just a minute. Let's think about this be a little logical. And let's reason together. What was the condition of man in the Garden of Eden? I'm talking about Adam and Eve here. Did they have fellowship with God in the beginning? Yes, they did. They had fellowship with God. What severed that relationship? What severed that fellowship? Well, sin. They disobeyed God's word. See, at one time, they were walking in the light as he is in the light, but as soon as they stopped walking according to the truth, fellowship with God was broken. That's the same way it is with young children before they reach the age of accountability. Young children are safe, but according to James chapter 1, verse 12 and following, talking about temptation, God doesn't tempt any man, but we're all drawn away by our own lust and enticed. Lust, when it conceives, brings forth sin. Sin, when it's finished, what? Well, it brings forth death. That's James chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. So when we think about this idea of fellowship, we maintain fellowship with God as long as we are obedient to him. Remember, according to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, sin is transgression of God's law. When we reach the age of accountability and we're drawn away by our own lust, and by the way, this happens to everyone that reaches to the age of accountability sooner or later, they're going to give in and they're going to sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse, 24, uh, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 9 and 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. So when we sin, that fellowship that we had when we were innocent children is broken. When we cease to adhere to the truth, 
fellowship with God is broken. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. The Israelites were upset. They called upon God to deliver them from their enemies. And what happened? God doesn't help them. And so they start to, they start to question God. What's wrong with God? Can he, is he not listening? Can he not hear us? Is he not strong enough to deliver us? And Isaiah says, no. God's ear's not weak that he cannot hear. His hand is not slack that he cannot save. Well, what's the problem? Your sin has separated you from God. Fellowship with God is broken when we cease to adhere to the truth. That's plainly taught throughout the scriptures. And sooner or later, that happens to all men. It happens to everyone. Sooner or later, we're all separated from God. Now, what happens when we're separated from God? Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Well, we're cut off from his blessings. We're cut off from his blessings. Now, that's not a good position to be in. So what we're looking at is trying to restore fellowship with God. Now, doesn't it make sense, isn't it reasonable, that if fellowship is broken between man and God, when we cease to adhere to the truth, then in order to restore fellowship with God, what do we have to do? We have to go back and adhere to the truth. You see, that's, that's, that's the nature of fellowship. That's why, that's why John says, I'm going to tell you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write unto you about Jesus Who's the answer to the sin problem? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Nobody comes to the Father. Fellowship cannot be restored with the Father except it be through Jesus Christ. You know, when, you know a lot of people think, well, all I have to do is call on the name of the Lord. So that's what I'm saying, strict that he's, do we have to call the name of the Lord? Well, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, when Ananias came to Saul of Tarsus, Saul's been there praying for three days and fasting, and he says, why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We call on the name of the Lord when we're baptized. It's done by his authority, according to his truth. Adherence to the truth is the means by which we obey the gospel and have our sins washed away. Adherence to the truth. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and following, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Have we not prophesied in thy name? And cast out demons in thy name? And, many, and, and in thy name done many wonderful works? It's not enough to do something in the name of the Lord. It has to be according to his authority, according to the truth. How's Jesus going to respond to those people that did things in his name? Depart from me, ye work of iniquity. I never knew you. What sad words. But such is the case when somebody tries to restore fellowship with God according to their own plan. You know, Paul prayed for the, the, the Jews. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, he says, My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. He wanted them to be saved. But they had to correspond to the truth. They had to obey the truth in order to be saved and be restored to fellowship with God. Well, I bear them record, he says, that they have a zeal toward God, but not according to knowledge. There's a lot of people that have a zeal toward God, but not according to knowledge. And as long as, as, as our zeal is not according to knowledge, we don't have any hope of having fellowship restored with God, let alone 
faithful brethren. They have a zeal toward God, but not a card of knowledge. Well, what, what, what are they doing? They've rejected the righteousness of God. That would be God's plan for man's righteousness. They've rejected that. They've rejected the truth, and they've gone about and established their own righteousness. We cannot be restored to fellowship with God if we don't accept the message of the gospel. If we don't adhere to the truth of the gospel, that's the only means of salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I believe that there are many people, even in the Lord's church, that are ashamed of the gospel. Even though Paul says that it's the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, it's for everybody. There's not one truth for the Jews and one truth for the Gentiles. There's not one truth for the whites and another for the blacks and another for the browns or the, or the, the redskins or the yellows. There's not one. There's only one gospel. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your geographic location of birth. It does, it's not dependent on your level of education or lack thereof. It's not dependent on the size of your bank account. The gospel is for all. And the gospel message is the only means to be restored to fellowship with God. This passage sets forth the, the, the case for inspiration. That's what sets this message apart from any other message that you might hear regarding fellowship with God. This message, he says, we received of him. The Greek there literally is from him. He's the source. God, Jesus is the source of it. He's the source of it. This speaks to inspiration. This is similar to what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He talks about the certified gospel. You guys that write sermons, here's a sermon outline, the certified gospel. Where did it come from? Well, it didn't come from man. That's the first thing he says. Gospel I preached, it didn't come from man. Second thing, he says, I wasn't taught it. In other words, he, somebody didn't teach it to him. It's not of man. Don't have anything to do. The origin is not of man. War is it from Paul? Received it by inspiration of God. That's the same place John got his message. He got it by inspiration. He received it by inspiration. Second Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. For we have not followed cunning devised uh, fables. When we may know unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did they make known to them? How did people, Peter make known to, to the, the ones to whom he was writing? The coming of the Lord. How did he do that? By revelation. He received it by revelation. He gave them, he, he taught them the message. The same message that John taught. The same message that Paul taught. And where do you think he got it? For received it from God, the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. <clears throat> we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Were unto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. There's that reference to light and dark again. You see that repeatedly in the Bible. Unto the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
There's the origin of the Old Testament and the origin of the New Testament is given by inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit. That's why this message is essential that we accept it as the truth and the only means of restoring fellowship with the Father. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And by the way, if you can't find authority for what you're doing in the Bible, it's not a good work. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. The apostle Paul said, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. All of these passages and many others like them indicate the divine authority that lies behind the message that brings fellowship between man and God. And between believers. <clears throat> Let's go down to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 again. The message, or at least the, fa the, the, the facet of the message that John states here is that God is light and in him is no darkness in all. Here we find the reason why God alone deserves the right to serve as the foundation and basis of our fellowship. Unlike mortal man, deity has no hint of darkness. Not even the slightest trace or speck of darkness exists in God. There's no darkness at all. Now this is a pretty well lit room, right? But do you realize that there's darkness in this room? If you don't believe me, just look under the pew in front of you. What do you see? Is there a shadow? I see some heads looking down there. What do you think, a snake or something? Yeah. You see what's down there? There's a shadow. Even in this well-lit room, there is some darkness. Not in God. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. On the other hand... We think about man, man has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23, thereby disqualifying himself from serving as the authority or basis for fellowship. Now, in our text, 1 John chapter 1, we also have the manner of life. Now, this is a prerequisite of fellowship. Now, a prerequisite simply is something that's required or necessary to something that's subsequent or something that comes along later. Now, in our text, the prerequisite to fellowship is walking in the light. And as we've already said, walking in the light is synonymous of walking in the, what, truth, right? If I'm going to walk in the light, then that means I'm walking in the truth. I'm abiding in the truth. Thayer talks about, and, and talking about light, Thayer says metaphorically the truth, it, that light represents the truth and its knowledge together with, with the spiritual purity associated with it. John makes a strong contrast here between light and darkness. And again, Thayer says of darkness, metaphorically, it, it, it references ignorance, respecting divine things and human duties, and the accompany of ungodliness and immorality together with their uh, con uh, consequent misery in hell. That's the idea of darkness. That's why sometimes Jesus, when he's talking about hell, says that you're going to be cast out into outer darkness. Darkness loves darkness. In fact, when Jesus, the light, came into the world, right, the world hated him because he exposed their evil deeds. That's what light does. 
God is pure and holy and he cannot abide sin. He cannot fellowship sin. That's why in God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We cannot have fellowship if we abide in darkness. In fact, that's what John says. Now, if walking in the light is equivalent to walking in the truth, then what is abiding in darkness? Well, that's abiding in error. That's abiding in sin. We can't have fellowship with God if we're still in our sin. Well, how do we overcome our sin? How do we overcome our sin? Well, we obey the gospel. We're back to the truth again. We're back to the truth. We have to learn about Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Back to the truth. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sin. Right? John 8, 24. You'll die in your sin. That doesn't sound good, does it? If we die in our sin, we're forever cut off from God. That's why it's essential that we are restored to fellowship with God. Through obedience to the gospel, we learn about Jesus Christ. We learn that he's the son of God. We learn that he lived a perfect example. We learn that he died a propitiation for our sin. And by the way, that's in 1 John chapter 2. Jesus is a propitiation for our sin. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. That's part of the message. That Jesus died for everybody. Too bad everybody's not going to avail themselves of that sacrifice. But the, the offer is there. The grace is extended to all. Well, that's part of the message. Jesus died on the cross. He's raised the third day. Have a summation of the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul said, I, I preached unto you the gospel that you receive, wherein you stand, whereby you are saved. See, what's the gospel? Well, he said, he tells us what it is. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the third day, for remission of sins according to the scriptures. So there's the message. There's the message. That's what Paul, that's what John says. I declared unto you the message that we received of him. And think about this idea of light and darkness, this contrast. Just as light in a room dispels darkness. Because light is incompatible with darkness. In fact, darkness is the absence of light. You ever think about that? Darkness is the absence of light. Light and darkness are incompatible. You can't have them both existing in the same space at the same time. Now what about spiritually speaking? We have the same thing carries over the same illustration. Light cancels out darkness. They're incompatible. We see that from first or second Corinthians chapter six and verse fourteen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what companionship or communion rather has light with darkness? These are rhetorical questions, and the answer to these is none. Absolutely none. There's no fellowship between light and darkness. That's why if we say we have fellowship with him and abide in darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. Because light and darkness are incompatible. Incompatible. That's why Paul was able to say to the Ephesians in chapter 5 and verse 11, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Walking in the light does not mean sinless perfection. I know that because Paul say, or John said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us of all sin. Right? Now, if, if walking in the light implies sinless perfection, we wouldn't need the blood to continue to cleanse us of all sin. No doubt we can and do sin as we walk in the light, but part of walking in the light is acknowledging that sin 
turning from it and asking God to forgive it. That's what a Christian does when they go back into sin. John, or Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. In fact, in our text, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sin or our fault, he's just and righteous to forgive us of all iniquity. How much time do I have? Nine minutes? Good. All right. Now, let's see where I want to go from here. Think about the benefits. The third thing that John talks about in this chapter is the benefits of fellowship. The benefits. Motivation is important. Proper motivation plays an important part of, of, of getting us to repent. Sometimes motivation can be in the form of a negative statement or admonition. Luke 13 and verse 3, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. There's the negative side. If you don't repent, this is what's going to happen. And then... If we look at at, uh, our text in verse 9, if we confess our sin, he's just and righteous to forgive us of our sin. So there's encouragement in a positive way. Running out of time, so I'm going to drop down here. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, here's another benefit that is extended to us by the blood of Christ. The Bible has a lot to say about the blood of Christ, both Old and New Testament. Old and New Testament. Old Testament types and shadow, New Testament fulfillment. Old Testament talks about the blood of bulls and goats being sacrificed for uh, atonement. And then in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. And so what? Well, God offered his son as a pure, perfect sacrifice, that propitiation, that atonement that appeases the wrath of God. Well, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, Ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Think about that. What was their condition before the blood of Christ? They were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promises, having no hope and without God in the world. That was the condition of the Gentiles prior to the blood of Christ. But now that they've obeyed the gospel and their sins have been washed away in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, right? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, our sins are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We have forgiveness through his blood, the redemption of sin, right? See, that's the the value of the blood of Christ. And when we apply that blood to our soul and, and figuratively in baptism, our sins are washed away. Our sins are remitted. We have forgiveness of sin. And we're 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 restored to fellowship with God. That essentially brings us right back to our proposition. Scriptural fellowship is dependent on adherence to the truth. We cannot have fellowship without adherence to the truth. Tonight, we're going to offer the invitation. There may be some here that are not enjoying the fellowship and the benefits of fellowship with God or the joy of having fellowship with faithful brethren. Remember, that fellowship begins with our relationship with God. If we have sin in our life, we do not have fellowship with God, and we cannot have fellowship with faithful brethren. But if we turn to the truth of God's Word, and we hear and heed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we learn that He is the Son of God, that He died as an atonement for our sins, that He was buried and raised the third day to justify our faith, He ascended it back into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, ruling his kingdom right now. And he's pleading with each and every sinner, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. If you have a burden of sin you'd like to lay down, you need to come to the Lord in humble obedience. 
repenting of your sins, confess his name before men to be baptized for remission of sin, call on the name of the Lord. And as a Christian, I encourage you, if you're living according to the will of the Lord, walking in the light every day, keep on doing what you're doing. Continue to study and grow. But sometimes temptation can overwhelm us. And we can go back into sin. And once again, that fellowship is broken. And all the benefits, all the blessings that come to you, being in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, they're gone. No more avenue of prayer. And I think that's the greatest of spiritual blessings aside from forgiveness of sin. The ability to cry, Abba, Father, and he will hear us as his children. A Christian that goes back into the world, goes back into sin, gives that up. They can no longer pray to God, and that's a pitiful situation to be in. So tonight, if you're subject to the invitation, if you need to be baptized for remission of sin, or if you need to be restored to faithful service, or if you just need prayers and encouragement, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing.